you need to be in touch with the community somehow or find a way to fit in to, let's say, contribute your, your talent. If it's, if it's in a charity or, or whatever it, it is, it's, a, it's very important to connect with the, the community. Business of Architecture, episode 279. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for growing an impactful and profitable architecture practice. Today, we welcome architect Nick Sontakis to the show. Nick runs a successful and highly awarded residential architecture practice in Scottsdale, Arizona. In today's episode, you'll discover how Nick wins impressive high caliber projects. The one thing Nick says architects need to do that they almost never do. The strategy Nick used to grow his practice when he was unknown and had no referrals. Tips for getting your work published and seen by your ideal clients and how to go from ho-hum projects to award-winning projects. Now, if you haven't already, I invite you to go get free instant access to a special training video that I've prepared specifically for small firm owners that shows you the four areas of your practice that you need to improve if you want to double your income in the next 12 months. That's the four-part architecture firm profit map video, and it's available for free by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page, and you'll get instant access. Now, before we jump into today's podcast episode, I wanted to give a shout out to two podcast hosts of the Midnight Charette podcast. If you're an architect, designer, someone interested in the world of design, you should check out the podcast that's run by David Lee and Maria Borderene. They host the Midnight Charette podcast, which in their own words is an explicit podcast about design, architecture, and people, but be warned, it's often not safe for work, close quote. Their conversation is truly raw, unscripted, no holds barred. So if you're looking for political correctness, then that is definitely not the podcast for you. I know David and Marina personally as they've attended a couple of my seminars. Listening to David and Marina on the podcast reminds me of those late night conversations hanging out in studio. So if you're looking for witty insider commentary that is at times thought-provoking and at times disturbing and at other times lighthearted and entertaining, go search for The Midnight Charette in your favorite podcast player. And with that, let's get on with today's show. Nick Sontakis, welcome to The Business of Architecture. Thank you, Enoch. Glad to be here. So uh, you have a number of very, very impressive projects that you've done. Uh, Did you focus on residential architecture? Well, uh, it, it's it's uh, funny that you say that because in Arizona, I've been here for the last uh, 24 years. I practice basically residential architecture, but in Montreal, where I came from, 15 years earlier, uh, I was practicing commercial architecture. I was known as a very you know very popular restaurant designer in Montreal. I did a lot of commercial buildings, office buildings, not that many residences because um, people didn't f- focus as much on uh, custom homes as they do here. So uh, I have a mixed background where I I can work on different types of buildings so that in Canada, I'm known as a commercial architect and in Arizona, I'm known as a residential architect. I see. And I'm looking at your website here and these houses and the homes you have on here, just uh, they're incredible. I mean, the scale of them, they're large, but they're also very interesting with the different design moves, the very impressive collection of homes that you've done. What would you say has been your secret to winning these impressive commissions? Well, basically, uh, I look at the, the client instead of the project itself. So uh, if you don't are not dealing with the right client, regardless of the, 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 the project size and so on, it, it may not be a great experience. So to me, uh, more importantly, the client is uh, number one, because you'll be spending about two, three or four years with them. So it's, it's, uh, it's easy to say, easier to say than done because a lot of people can't just select their clients. But after a certain amount of time, you get to know or understand who is the right fit for you. And then uh, what I explain to them is that I don't design the home by myself. Uh, I, I take the input from, from the clients and also from the site itself. And uh, I like to think that my projects uh, vary from one to the other because of they're on different sites and different clients, almost like uh, making a, a tailored a suit for somebody's body. You take their measurements and you make a suit fit them. So uh, that's how I see a custom home. 
uh, working for 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 different people. Okay, so we, there are clients that have big dreams and and uh, their eyes are bigger than their wallets. But it looks here like you've been actually able to hook up with a lot of clients that actually have the budget to be able to do some large and impressive projects. What would you say would be the secret to connecting and winning these kind of projects as opposed to projects that you know that they're small budgets and you're constantly fighting with them and they're they're not um, realistic about their budget. Well, first of all, uh, architects also have to be realistic about budgets. And uh, when you're designing something, you have to know what the cost is going to be. So what I tell clients, and I tell them basically at, when I meet them what they need to hear, not what they want to hear, as a lot of people do, unfortunately. And uh, if they want uh, certain uh, things that are beyond, uh, let's say, the budget, because I always ask, ask them first, what is the budget that you're thinking of and if it's possible to, to do a project with, with that on that particular site. Um, you know, uh, I, I give them the reality because of having the experience of building uh, projects over and over again. You get to know the pricing, the people that can work on these projects, and so on. So you give them a very clear uh, understanding of what they will be spending and what the outcome is going to be. Uh, but sometimes the, re the reality of that is going to shock some people, and I'd rather have them understand that at the beginning that what they're getting into as opposed to uh, starting a project and then taking it to the end and having them disappointed that they spent more out of their budget and so on. So it's a responsibility of architects to really guide the client. And uh, I also, in terms of uh, pricing uh, and, and budgets, a lot of my projects are not high budget. They just look different because they're designed uh, specifically to meet a specific site and and budget, so that uh, if you, the client allows you the freedom of designing uh, the, the the home for 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 the the, the money that they have, then uh, the the right architect will be able to uh, make something possible and something very unique. And that's what I'm looking for: the right client, not necessarily the right project. And Nick, generally, how do your clients find you? Um, it's usually um, word of mouth, and we ha we also market uh, our, our projects in um, publications and so on. So over many years, uh, people have seen the work that we that we do uh, consistently and, and constantly in uh, publications, and that that helps. Although I have to say, we've been in publications and had stories of ten, twelve pages doesn't necessarily translate into immediate uh, projects, as a lot of people may think. It, it could take years before a client uh, comes to you after they've seen your work uh, in the past and say, look, I've been waiting to use you. As many people have told me, you know, 10 years ago we were deciding to use you, but then some somebody came along and we used them, and now that we're ready to do the next home, we're, we're, we're taking the decision to, to do it with, with you. So... It's a long-term thing. Uh, it's constant uh, marketing and being uh, uh, exposing your work in the publications, on social media, and so on. It really helps. But word of mouth is the most important because if you have bad experiences w with people, that goes around as well. So bad news travels very quickly <laughs> in our profession. You don't want to be on that end. Yeah, you can't survive long having a bad experience with your clients. That's for sure. Exactly. Tell me, what is your, what kind of marketing do you do in publications? In publications, um, most of the time, uh, we have, uh, we, we'd like to get our work published uh, in, certain, in, in the magazines. And what happens is that we uh, supply the content to them. And if they're interested in, in the homes that we've designed, they will pick them up and do a story. But I've also, what I have done here in Arizona in the last 24 years I've taken uh, matters into my own hands and I've created my own publication initially so that I can go, go directly to the general public. And that's a, a long story of how it started, but it was the, the way for me to break through and not have to go through uh, magazines and so on uh, and just get the message across to, uh, to the people. And that uh, worked very well. And today I, I publish uh, various architectural magazines for architects by architects. And uh, we can get into that a, a bit uh, a bit later, and I could describe how this whole situation happened <laughs> into publishing and architecture at the same time.
Yeah, that, that's very interesting. And we'll definitely get into that. So when you say that you're sending to publications, let's say, let's not talk about your own publications now, but if you're going to a third party publication, what are the exact steps that you're taking to put the materials in front of them? What have you found to be successful to be picked up by magazines, both in terms of paid placements and free placements? Uh, well, first of all, they have to know uh, of your work, and uh, they would have had to see it either in in uh, your own marketing or other publications, uh, or you have to uh, c- contact uh, the the editors, the publishers, and so on of the different magazines, uh, network with them, which I think is extremely important. Because don't forget, they're also looking for content, and they don't know what they don't hear about. So you have to to be in contact with them as well. Uh, so when we complete a, a project, we uh, invite uh, people from various publications to come and take a look and see what they think and if they can fit that project into their uh, in, into their publications. Um, that, it sometimes though it becomes a little difficult because when I was first starting off here in Arizona, contemporary architecture was not very as popular as it is today, and some publications would not uh, want to, uh, to to publish the more contemporary homes, and that's what led me to come up with my own so that I kick-started that and, uh, and br- brought the, the, my message to the public. And then it, it worked, worked back again, where these publications now that we're not uh, doing contemporary work are all over it. So it's kind of uh, come full, full circle, and now we do our own publications, and we are also uh, advertising others. I don't believe personally in uh, uh, taking advertisements if you were in publications, if the work is not, uh, it, it doesn't deserve to, let's say, be, be there or is at a certain level. Uh, so uh, I, would, I would tend to say it's good to get something published. And then if you want to take advertisements with, with magazines, that's great too. But uh, it, it should, you know, try more to get it published as opposed to just advertising in magazines. Hey, Architect Nation, real fast, I want to draw your attention to May 1st through the 3rd, 2019. I'm hosting the Architect Business Summit in Chicago, Illinois, and I would love to meet you there in person. During these three days, some of the most successful architects I've had the pleasure of working with will pull back the curtain to reveal what they're doing to grow their income, freedom, and impact as firm owners. This will be the must attend event for architecture firm owners in 2019. You won't want to miss this. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash live to get information on who will be speaking and find out how to grab your ticket. Okay. And what would you say would be a a reasonable budget for a firm that wanted to devote some time, energy, and effort in getting published in some of the local magazines. What could they do? Give me an idea of uh, amount of money you think that it would take in a year to get some decent exposure through those sources. I would say that uh, you would have to spend, first of all, there are some publications that would charge uh, about four or $5,000 for an entire uh, full-page ad. Uh, and they would expect you to do that repeatedly, maybe uh, over uh, quarterly or, or biannually and so on, or, or even monthly. So that could be on the high side where you spend about maybe $60,000 a year of uh, doing, doing work with, uh, with one particular magazine, or you could uh, do um, uh, less and, and spread yourself over uh, several magazines. But I think you should be doing a, maybe at least a... I would say about a thousand dollars every month in marketing because if people don't know that you're around, they just don't know it. And if you're trying to to find the right type of clients, they have to see your work somewhere. So uh, the more if if you can have print, you have work in print, it will lead them to your website. It will lead them to uh, your social media and so on. So it's important to constantly be uh, out there. Otherwise, people don't know that you exist. Great. And what, what avenues have you found to be useful for networking with uh, the publishers and people that produce these magazines to get to know them? A, a lot of times these magazines uh, cre- uh, create networking events. And uh, I would say a lot of architects don't take advantage of, of actually going to these events. Uh, whereas there's a lot of uh, people that are, uh, I would call them um, their sellers, which are tradespeople and so on. Uh, there's very few buyers wh- who I put in the category of interior designers, architects, and builders that show up at these events. And I find it kind of strange that 
when these ne- the events the events are uh, scheduled, a lot of architects don't bother going because they don't necessarily want to network or talk with too many people, which is really a shame because these are the people that could lead to to more work, and they also need to have uh, some contact with uh, architects who are in make a lot of the decisions that can use their their products. So I would say to take advantage of uh, networking as much as possible. Uh, I would say at least, you know, once uh, once every week or two weeks, it's important because if you're busy and you're just in your office, one day, like we it happened to so many people during the recession, one day everything stopped and nobody knew what was going on because they had no contact with anybody. They were just too busy working on their own stuff. It's important to also spend that time networking. Extremely important. Nick. Yes. What what have you found to be, when you go to these networking events, you meet someone, obviously it's not going to be very useful if it's a one-off experience. Do you have a process or a system for staying in touch with these people and building relationships over time? Um, actually, you know, the, the, the way that it works for me is FaceTime, as I call it, is extremely important. Uh, just because you go to a networking event, you can't expect results to happen instantly or uh, or, it, you know, I'm not going to waste my time with this company because there's nothing there for me. It's so important to understand that there are people that work at different companies. They're, they're human beings, and we have to become friends. And that's how I see it. Because these people, don't forget, they're also going to be uh, working at other companies in the future, if, or they have uh, contacts with people in the business or, or their friends, and they could re- always recommend you as an architect. Because what counts primarily, besides being a talented architect is also your character. So if you have the right type of personality that they find easy to, to get along with, that those that news gets around as well. So meeting with people face to face is more important than which which company they work for, or what they can do for you or you can do for them at that particular moment. It's a it's a long term experience. And before you know it, once you start meeting more and more people and get, you start getting introductions from the same people that you've been meeting with, with others that are going to expand your network. And that's something that architects are not doing enough of. They're not getting out of their offices and going to spend time meeting up with people. I'm not saying that for everybody, but I think that's extremely important. And I think the most successful ones are always out there. Either they, they, they're networking in some fashion, either by you know, playing golf or or going to cert, certain events and so on. It's extremely important to be out there and visible and meeting people all the time. Would you consider yourself uh, more on the introverted side or the extroverted side, Nick? I'm a total extrovert. Complete. <laughs> 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 there's, there's nothing introverted about me. <laughs> if I have to say something to somebody, I just say it. You know, you have to be honest. And sometimes honesty is the best thing. Uh, like I said, you tell people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And, and I'm talking about our business. But at the same time, if um, if there's something constructive that you you can tell somebody and help them out, there's nothing nothing wrong with that. They will appreciate that, regardless of what it means or a grat- if you get instant gratification from that for yourself. You know that positive energy always comes back in different ways, and it's always beneficial. I I can't say enough about that. So, one thing that I found is a lot of architects, and myself included, tend to be more on the introverted side. What would you say to someone if they're in that position? They know they need to get out and network, and they know they need to create those relationships, but it just doesn't come naturally. Do you have any tips or techniques or suggestions to help them maybe do something that's uh, not in their comfort zone? I would say if you can, uh, if you have a friend that's a bit more extroverted and that's in the, in the same uh, business where you have another, uh, another colleague. I mean, don't forget architects, your best friend could be another architect. And, and that's something that I find uh, architects don't understand that. Well, my colleagues are for, for me, they're my best friends period, because we go through the same things together and we understand and we, we can fight with each other. And if we have any issues, we, we could uh, discuss them and get feedback. So if you are an introvert and you're not used to going uh, uh, out and so on, uh, maybe one of your colleagues uh, is is more uh, more inclined to, to do that. So why don't you team up with them and just go go to an event together, um, and 
and and again meet meet more of your your colleagues as well and start creating a dialogue and start having meetings you know every, every once a month and so on just to discuss things in general about about the business i find that uh, since i've been uh, connected with a lot of um, a lot of the architects here in Arizona and and everywhere else uh, in, across the country it's been so easy to talk to people in our profession and get a lot of positive feedback and um I, I'm, I get emails from people from other states that, that uh, colleagues of mine, and they, they ask me about certain um, people or certain products and so on. There's nothing wrong with that, to share information and maybe go to events together. Uh, and not only that, you, you'd be surprised that, um, you know, they may know other people that you can get introduced to as well. So I think that's a, that would be a, a way to, uh, to expand your networking by, by teaming up with somebody. How much time do you spend personally doing things that would be considered business development and marketing? In my case, because I am also a publisher, I spend at least as much time in in uh, marketing and uh, and uh, networking as I do on my architectural work. It's it's these are like two businesses running at the same time. Uh, it, it is a little bit more th- th- than normal because most people don't have that that type of time. Uh, I am able to, uh, let's say, take on less work uh, because I also benefit from my networking and my publishing business. But for me, it's a 24-7 and both uh, businesses run, I-, I would say, equally. There's not one that I don't spend less time on, on this. I spend as much time as I need. Uh, to to go out there and network and uh, connect with people um, as I do with actually doing my work with clients. So I'm open 24 hours, <laughs> and nobody tries to stop me. <laughs> self-employed, I joke around a lot, but you know, if when you're self-employed, there is no nine to five. And 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 you know, it's 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 not for everybody, uh, but for me, it just seems to work well. I I enjoy just being part of. Uh, I'm part of the, the the process of of both uh, architectural practice and and publishing, I think it it works very well, and it's something that uh, from the publishing end we don't do enough, and we are relying also on the people that are outside of our profession to create uh, you know the the the, the stories and, and everything, and 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 pick the the type of architecture, and not necessarily give the the public what they really need to hear sometime. Uh, I think architects need to take control of that and, uh, you know, get it out, out to the, me- the message to the public as much as they can. Okay. So let's just say that you were, uh, if you did only have an architectural practice, based upon your knowledge of what it takes to form those relationships and to be able to win the kind of high quality caliber work that you're working on, um, you know, what would you recommend that a, another architect spend and devote to marketing and business development if that's their only business well like like i said before you have to market somehow and uh, you know social media is extremely important and for people that are beginning it's actually a very economical and very effective way to get out there so you know uh, and i see a lot of people doing that and it's important to get as many contacts and friends as you can on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram, and so on. Show your work, show it in different stages, and, and so on. That does not cost much, but it does take time, so obviously time is money. Uh, at the same time, uh, publishing, you know, as taking out uh, ads or getting your, your work published in magazines is important as well, and it could be economical because uh, you, you you will get selected and get uh, 10, 12 pages on, on a project, or it can be very expensive by buying ads, but uh, everything has to work in order to build up your, your uh, to give you yourself exposure that you'll need so, and, and also identify you as a type of architect that you want to be. So if you're, if you want to do contemporary work, uh, then you should publish work like that. Doesn't mean that as an architect, you you should be able to do all types of styles. And and I don't like the word style because I don't really believe in that as much. I believe in, like I said, site and client and so on. But, um, you have to get yourself out there. And that's something that, uh, you either spend the time or you spend the money or you do both. 
Awesome. And, and per, let's just talk yeah. percentage wise is how much percentage of an architect's time, let's say it's a sole practitioner, or maybe someone that has one or two employees, how much percentage of their time realistically do you think they should be devoting to bringing in the work, getting out there in the community, developing new business? Uh, I would say at least 25% of your time, you know, if you at least a couple of hours a day, uh, you need to be in touch with the community somehow or find a way to fit in to, uh, to let's say, contribute your, your talent. If it's, if it's in a charity or, or whatever it, it is, it's, a, it's very important to connect with uh, the community. Uh, just being in the office is not going to do, do as much good as it is to be out there and, and expose yourself at the same time. Um, I find that, um, we don't do enough of that because we don't want to take the time. But like I said, when you, when you send out that positive energy, it comes back in different forms. And really, people do identify with, uh, with, uh, with, with those people that are, are, are putting in effort in doing other things besides just having a one track. This is my business and I want to get as much business as possible coming in and I don't care about anything or anybody else. That's that's in my opinion wrong. You have to you have to give back to people, regardless of what it's going to give you, uh, in initially or instantly. It, it's it's a long term thing and it comes back. Uh, and I can tell you that from experience because I it's been the last um, thirty eight years that I've been in, in private practice, and it comes back years and years later. People don't realize that something that you've done maybe twenty years ago with someone turns out to become an important. Uh, project or something different or just I can I can trace back projects that I'm getting today to the origin of when they started it could be decades ago I just I just got a job in Montreal to do my first restaurant in a quarter century and I was known as a restaurant architect I've done over 120 restaurants and you know after 25 years not having done any I'm so ready for this project but it comes from people that you know from many many years back and that you've you know, interacted with. So you can't just have contacts that are temporary. These contacts will become a permanent part of, of your life. And um, very important to get out there and give as much as you can, especially to the communities that you're, that you're involved with and the charities that you, that you support. There's nothing wrong with putting in the time and, and money in many cases to, to do what you can. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelming fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.